Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Seattle's newest council member, Tanya Wu, is bringing a strong sense of cultural awareness to her job. So how will that shape her role in Citywide Position 8? Plus, what are her plans as chair of the wide-ranging Sustainability, City Light, and Arts and Culture Committee? I'll get answers to these questions and the ones that viewers like you are sending in too. Coming up on City Inside Out, Council Edition. We were catching graffiti takers once a week, surprisingly enough, and it, we were surprised at who these people are. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here we are with Tanya Wu, the city council member in the citywide position eight seat. How are you doing right now? Good. Happy to be here. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, and thank you. I know you've been through a lot over the past couple of weeks here. And I got to say, it certainly seems like you're starting off your term with a bang or a boom or a number of other sounds. I wanted to show our viewers this is the scene from inside City Hall not long before we recorded this show. <laughs> There were lion dancers, there was plenty of noise in the main lobby of City Hall, and coming out of all this was a proclamation you headed up with Councilmember Morales to officially recognize Lunar New Year as a citywide celebration. It's the Year of the Dragon, which is a symbol of good fortune, justice, prosperity, and strength. I heard you say that on the dais. Sounds like it's going to be a good year. Uh, Lynn Tai, who was one of the other candidates for the Position 8 job before you were selected, was petitioning for this proclamation. I wanted to talk about this. Why is it important to you, important to Seattle, to have Lunar New Year recognized in this way? Yeah, so this proclamation was community-led um, and community-written as well, along with Lin Tai and other community members. And this is important because uh, for many cultures in Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, we celebrate Lunar New Year. It's one of our biggest celebrations, festivals of the year. Um, everything just kind of concentrates on family, on building community, as well as being able to celebrate the arrival of spring. Mm. And I, I wanted to speak about it maybe a little more broadly, just the importance of your Asian American heritage and what's, what that means to the city council here. Seattle, as we know, has a large Asian population, upwards of 15%, according to the census figures. And I think a lot of people, especially in the Chinatown ID, would say representation, representation matters. What do you think about that? Yes, I absolutely agree that representation does matter. Having a seat at the table, which is something a lot of communities are fighting for, um, and having that perspective of diverse cultures is really important on the Seattle City Council. And I'm very excited that you know the council is very diverse mm -hmm. going forward. Yeah, and I remember you talking about this. This is a situation where you were making this proclamation about uh, Lunar New Year at the same time when Black History Month. There was an, uh, another proclamation talking about that as well. Can you talk about that larger issue of diversity on the council? Because I think it's it's an important part of who you are and, and your past, and I think an important part of this city, too, to recognize those different pieces. Yes, I think it's amazing that we are celebrating you know, Lunar New Year as well as Black History Month in the same day. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite significant because we stand in solidarity with all of our you know, Asian and black communities mm -hmm. and, and showing Doing that on a larger scale, I think, is really important. And the fact that there's just so much diversity, so much perspective, mm -hmm. and so many community members on the city council shows a sense of, I think, working together, collaboration, communication, uh, outreach and engagement, especially to many of our communities here, as well as role modeling and inspiration. Like, I would never have thought being on this council was possible without, you know, community leaders like Cheryl Chow, who was on the council in the early 1990s, late mm -hmm. 1990s, yeah. and seeing her as a Chinese American on the council inspired me to actually run. And I wanted to come full circle on that because I'd have, it was very interesting. The same week that you were sworn in as Seattle's newest council member, the city unveiled its newest street sign, Cheryl Chow Boulevard, right outside Franklin High School. She, of course, was a giant in the Seattle community, an educator, served on the council, as you mentioned, from 1990 to 97. I believe you were on her drill team when you were younger, way back in the day. Do you see yourself as taking up her mantle, maybe following her model of leadership? Are there others you look up to in that way? Can you talk about that? Oh, yes. Um, so I, I I think I'm standing on giant shoulders. There's no way I could ever take up the mantle, but I hope to like, continue that legacy of strong female leaders in the Asian American community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I grew up, I remember Auntie Ruby Chow yep. as well, who was on the King County Council, and being inspired by her, Auntie Cheryl, um, and of course, Councilor Martha Cho, Velma mm -hmm. Valoria, uh, Dolores Vanga, all these really great Asian American leaders, as well as in recent 
and Asian American leaders. And so hopefully be able to inspire that next generation of young young people to, yeah. to, to realize that they can do this. Th those, those are some tough ladies you're talking about there in terms of the Seattle political scene. How would you describe your, your leadership uh, style, I guess? Is it something similar to that? Or how would you describe how you're going to lead and maybe how your heritage is going to uh, inform and direct how you lead, too? Yeah, so I think it's being grounded in community is going to be very important. Um, making sure that all of our decisions are community-led. Uh, my experience being on the ground uh, with, you know, building affordable housing as well as my work on the Community Watch. We go out, I still continue to go out every single week, uh, walking around the neighborhood, going into the encampments, yeah. trying to help our in-house neighbors and try to connect people with resources. I think that's really important to be on the streets to see what's happening. When we saw fentanyl, it wasn't a surprise. We saw that two, three years ago coming into our communities. And, tr and I think, you know, it's never too late to come up with a plan, and that's one of my priorities is how do we, it's, it's killing people. And, you know, we, I've been on my hands and knees providing Narcan and CPR yeah. to community members, and this is definitely an issue we have to tackle. And this is something you're still doing out on Community Watch. This, this is part of your, your daily routine or weekly routine, I guess, as a council member. Yes, yes, and, and going and connecting with business owners, yeah. small business owners, especially in Chinatown International District, mm -hmm. seeing what's happening at 12th and Jackson, talking to our seniors, um, people who don't usually, you know, express their thoughts, but trying to help that, uh, I guess, shape my perspectives and my outlook and especially my background going forward. Yeah. And I thought it was very interesting. I remember during the election last fall, it was an issue where I saw it in, in District 2 there. A lot of people did not vote, unfortunately. And I think part of your job might be, and I, I don't know if I'm pushing this too far, Councilmember Wu, but uh, trying to galvanize certain areas to be more engaged and engaged in a way where they can talk to the city and, and get some policy passed, etc. Do you have a knowledge of that or an, an awareness of that? I, I really thought that was striking, just the lack of people who showed up to vote, unfortunately, this past Yes. Fall. We had such a historic turnout, low turnout yes. of voters, especially. And that's something I'm intimately aware and and have tackled. Um, how do we reach people who are the furthest away from government? How do we do that extra outreach so people are not coming to us, we're going to, to communities, we're going to neighborhoods that don't typically are heard. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people are struggling in their day to day, you know, they're so busy focused on how are they going to be able to feed their families, that politics is the furthest away from their minds, they're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And so how do we let people know and how do we involve people civically in terms of this is how you have a voice, this is how you can be heard. Yeah. And I think it also goes to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of city resources that are available that mm -hmm. people are unaware of and how do we go out there and make sure that people are able to have access to this. Yeah. And, and I think... And as chair of City Light, I know you're thinking about that utility bill uh, situation that the city has where they, they can help out people of, of lower income with that. I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, yes, many things no, like that sounds like. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, a lot of people who are fixed incomes are struggling to pay their property taxes. Like, there are programs that can help people okay. like that. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. I, I did want to talk about some exciting news coming out of the Chinatown ID in the last couple of weeks. Amazon putting forward $250,000 to revive the Chinatown ID night market. It's a long-time tradition, as you know. Had to be canceled last year amid some rising costs, lack of sponsorship. You grew up in a family of small businesses in the CID. I wanted to talk about what this means to have this market back up and running. Oh, my gosh, yes. Ha having all of our festivals or celebrations is, is of paramount importance. People look forward to that year-round. And so I think it really hurt a lot of people, um, I guess, emotionally, morally, mm. to see that that night market was canceled. And so I'm very excited that it will be able to continue going forward in the years to come. And, and it's something that you know, the small businesses, the residents, the seniors, children, everybody looks forward to and very excited yeah. to hear that it will continue. Yeah, some good energy around that this year. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, back to your work on the council here, and maybe a more sobering topic here. You've also worked with Councilmember Morales on a proclamation for a day of remembrance in February here for the expulsion of Chinese people from Seattle. Can you explain the importance of this proclamation and, and maybe some of the history behind it, too? Yeah, so this proclamation really affects me personally. My family's been here since 1887, but because of you know racist policies like... Um, Expulsion the, yeah, and the Exclusion, and exclusion Act. Yeah. Act yeah. Yes, like I am the first generation born in Seattle, um, which is you know a lot of the females in my family were not able to immigrate here, and so I am that product of these racist policies, and it affects me mostly on the almost every single day. Yeah. And so some of that history, you know, uh, 
we, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of racist policies, yeah. um, and this telling this, Chinatown to move basically yes, exactly. I mean, move out from where it was. This yeah, was Chinatown lot. moved three times um, mm -hmm. uh, back in. Back when the expulsion happened, a whole group of people forced all the Chinese occupants in Seattle to leave, yeah. basically. Yeah, put them on a ship to San Francisco, yes. right? Yeah. Exactly. And so we want to make sure that that does not happen again, that, you know, we have more just immigration policies going forward, and we're welcoming of immigrants and refugees especially going forward, and we're not repeating history. Yeah. And so realizing that that history is not perhaps one of our proudest moments as a city, mm -hmm. but how do we go forward to make sure that that doesn't happen again? It was the, uh, you didn't want it to be forgotten, it really feels like with this proclamation. Is that kind of a piece of this too, I guess? Yes, and, and to make me honor history, remember the people who fought against exclusion, expulsion, who stood in solidarity with our communities, and you know, especially seeing some of these policies going forward and making sure that we fight against them and make sure that, you know, we're welcoming of all people yeah, is really and, important. And, and I really, I, I see some present day, uh, not exactly correlations, but I remember when the pandemic was in its its, uh, its darkest hour here a couple of years ago, there was a lot of different uh, anti-Asian hate going on, unfortunately, in the Chinatown ID because of COVID, et cetera. And I think having this present day reminder maybe of, of the past and how some of these at least uh, attitudes can be uh, repeated in the future. Is, is that a piece of this too? I think you want to bring it to the present day and put it in front of people as well. Yes, that's a huge piece of it. I mean, it, it's systemic racism comes up in different ways. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it comes up when our seniors were afraid to come out after 4 p.m. There's 2,000 seniors who live in the China International District, but we're so fearful. And so how do we come up with programs? We had, you know, our community came with senior escorts, yeah. making sure people felt safe. And then we also had high impact projects happening around that neighborhood. And, you know, with that history of Chinatown being moved three times, being forced back every time property became valuable, mm -hmm. um, how do we preserve our neighborhood? We've just named, unfortunately, top 11 most endangered neighborhoods in the U.S. Wow. Not a distinction we want to have. And so how do we make sure that we both preserve that neighborhood so we're not slowly losing pieces of it? Yeah. And that's really important with, you know, sound transit coming forward. How do we mindfully allow for more transit opportunities, but at the same time preserve the neighborhood. Yeah, I was glad you touched on that. You're going to be in the middle of that conversation now. I know Sound Transit makes the decision, but is there some way you want to help, help guide that decision in terms of where a light rail station goes close to Chinatown? Or Chinatown ID, what do you think? Yes, I think it's going to be very important making sure that everybody's heard. Um, a lot of people along Line 1, Beacon Hill, Rainier Beach, have not been heard or not aware of the different options that are available. And how do we make sure that, you know, there are a lot of, I think, mitigation that needs to be done depending on where the station is sited. Um, there's pros and cons to both, unfortunately, but hopefully being able to do that community outreach to the entire line one, as well as how do we address issues of access, especially with our seniors and with people who English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very important going forward, especially helping the small businesses and the community. Right, right. You want people to access us access it, but you don't want to knock those businesses off the charts if, if you have the construction going on too long. This is a, a very delicate situation here. I, I wanted to talk about something a little bit further with you. I mentioned these two proclamations you've worked on with Councilmember Morales, and I feel like I have to ask the question here. You two were political opponents just a few months ago. In the fall, a very strong back and forth in that debate, as I recall. Now you're working side by side. I just wanted to get to this larger question of What's it been like trying to come together as a council after you were a named named as a council member through this appointment process in late January? Oh, great. I, I'm, I'm very honored to be able to serve on the Seattle City Council alongside with Council Member Morales. Um, I, I believe it's great that South Seattle, which is, you know, typically underserved and under, you know, represented, there's a lot of issues happening there that is addressed citywide as well, that's getting double the coverage. And we're able to work side by side to address all these issues of public safety, homelessness and housing, especially. And I think there's a sense of collaboration on, on the council. Um, most council members are in their offices. My first week, first two weeks have been amazing because council members and their staff have been dropping by my office, yeah. asking how they can help and just being able to walk over and ask questions and someone next door it has been amazing. So the sense of collaboration, the sense of communication has been amazing. Yeah, and I think that's going to need to grow going forward as these different pieces come out. And uh, I, I guess I just wanted to touch on the point that you have a lot of hard work ahead and we've been hearing from a lot of viewers about this. Viewers want to know about it. Here's a question that came in from Brian. It goes like this. What is one specific thing you want to work on or get past in the council this year? So moving past the proclamations, let's say, maybe towards more ideas about some policy-based legislation. Do you have one thing that you might have your mind on right now when it comes to that? 
Oh, oh, uh, there are a couple of things. Okay, <laughs> a lot of let's break it down. Important what we got? things going forward. But I think you know, speaking generally, um, public safety is is a huge priority for I think not only just myself but for all council members. And how do we look at every city department, every city agency, and how do we tackle this issue from all different perspectives? And seeing public safety in all our different committees and how that affects not only young people or seniors, but with that mindset going forward in terms of you know. Uh, the regional homeless authorities contract yeah. is being renewed this year. We have the the police contract as well. Um, that I guess priority is on the back of our minds for every single piece of legislation, everything that we see and that we do. Mm -hmm. Especially, I think the focus is on young people. How do we help young people? How do we create more jobs, economic opportunity? How do we, you know, for for my committees, arts and culture, you know, yeah. commerce follows culture. How do, are we able to revitalize our neighborhoods, downtown's core, especially? Mm -hmm. How do we get more youth involved in the arts? Um, and every single committee, I think we all have that that mindset. Okay, I, I wanted to ask a. a public safety question specifically. One came in from Kimberly who wanted us to ask you this. What steps will be considered to rid Little Saigon of the open-air drug trafficking den at the 12th and Jackson bus stop? Still a hot, hot mess, she says, after emphasis patrols were deployed, as well as the encampment on the north end of the Jose Rizal Bridge that's overrun with open-air drug use and trafficking. Kimberly, thank you for the question. Two persistent public safety hotspots right there. Some thoughts about what she's writing. Yes, so uh, my team, we go to 12th and Jackson, Little Saigon area once a week, um, and we've gotten to know the people who are there. And so I think we have to approach this from a human, humanistic, compassionate um, stance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the community, you know, people who are closest to the problem, I believe, have the solution. And the community has come together and, and want street-level ambassadors mm. to make that connection with the people who are at 12th and Jackson and try to find out the root cause of why they are there. Every person is different, and so whether one person is there is different from the other, and why they're engaged there and why they find community there and mm. how do we tackle it from that level yeah. and try to fulfill those needs and get people inside, get people help in terms of, you know, drug addiction or whatever they need to get them off the streets. Yeah. And I think that's going to take everybody being involved, but I think it's going to take a lot of investments yeah. from community as well as from the city, as well as from the county, yeah. making sure we have those people out there, lead, um, reach, have done amazing work there. Mm -hmm. but I think we need more attention to that area. Um, what we're doing at Third Avenue Project, I yeah, think, right. is ha looking at that and the results and learning from those lessons. How do we apply that to Walton Jackson? Yeah, bring that well. model uphill. Yes, huh? and okay. then you know, I think a lot of people are looking at some of the services and organizations that are in that area, mainly Navigation Center. Sure. How do we make sure that what's happening in that area? There was a shooting there last uh, couple weeks ago. At, yeah. I think there's shooting there like every couple of weeks. Mm. Um, how do we address those issues and making sure people are safe in that area who are coming to Navigation Center for those services? Yeah. Um, and how do we, are we able to address people who are looking for housing who, who camp outside? Right. Getting them inside is going to be important. And I guess uh, just looking a little further at that, you mentioned an ambassador program maybe. I'm thinking about those downtown ambassadors. We see them all over the place with their yellow jackets, et cetera. Potentially something like that up in up at 12th and Jackson maybe? That, yes, that I might think, help? Okay. I think community is asking for something yeah. very similar. Um, but the problem is, you know, always funding. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and, you know, we're hearing, you know, from different organizations in that area, they're paying for security, like yeah. over a million dollars a year in security. So how are we going to be able to navigate around that um, and be able to offer, you know, purchase from a humanistic yeah. standpoint? Yeah, there's going to be a lot to tackle there. I, I wanted to talk about some other recent news here. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals sided with City Attorney Ann Davison recently and reinstated Seattle's graffiti ordinance here. It's a persistent problem in Seattle. The mayor has relaunched the city's graffiti abatement program with an increased emphasis in Chinatown ID. What impact do you think the relaunch of this program is going to have? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, graffiti is a huge problem. I think it centers around consent. It's also mm. very damaging towards all the small mom and pop businesses there having yeah. to pay hundreds and thousands to clean up that graffiti. And, you know, it's not just graffiti, it's etching on the glass as right. well. That is right, right, right. very yeah. concerning. It, it hits us morally. Um, and it's it's something that's an ongoing process. And so I think, you know, we, we it's unfortunate because I, I hear people stop reporting. And so how do we educate business owners 
um, and residents to please continue reporting. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we have to hit it from a different angle, like this educational aspect, right. arts and culture with our young people, right. um, and people from all ages. How yeah. do we get them engaged in other activities where they're not, where they feel like their freedom of expression isn't on? Right, right. Because I, I think the mayor was talking about this. He's trying to strike this balance between okay bigger penalties for these prolific taggers. We gotta make sure something's happened with them from the criminal sense, but these diversion options maybe for some of these lower level offenders, that's a difficult balance to strike, I would have to think. Some thoughts about that, what the mayor's saying there, uh, making sure we take care of these people who are prolific and making sure we give some other options to people who might be, unfortunately, just starting uh, doing graffiti. Yes, so um, with my work on the Community Watch, yeah. so we were catching graffiti taggers once a week, surprisingly enough, and it, we were surprised at who these people are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we basically talk to them, you know, hey, this is hurting a mom and pop business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the city fines people after a couple of days yep. if they don't clean up the graffiti. That's right. It hurts the um, business doubly, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And so, I mean, other, other than looking at how we correct that betting goal, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. talking to people, like, do you realize what you're doing, how you're hurting people and, and small businesses and the, the amounts of issues that arise? And I, I think, you know, they, people used to just run away from us. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> or right. Or they will, they'll, they'll, like, you know, chat with us for a bit. But, you know, we try to get, get instill with them a sense of community. Yeah. You know, please come back and help us clean this up. I mean, yeah. making people do community service and coming in to see the efforts, and I think we'd be helpful as well. So I think, yeah. you know, diversion programs are really important. So yeah. How do yeah. we get them into the community to see what is happening yeah. and get them involved to help with the cleanup. I think yeah. it's very important. Sounds like you've been really interactive with it, so we'll see what happens there. I wanted to move on to budget questions, a lot of them for the council, of course, this year, this projected budget gap of more than $200 million. And I remember talking to you on the campaign trail about this, too, last fall. Are you looking to make more cuts, looking to find new revenue? I know there's a big issue here, but how are you planning to tackle that budget gap? Yes, I know there's going to be a lot of hard decisions to be made going forward. Um, and so I, I think we have to go through that exercise where we have to find out what investments are working, um, how we're getting the results results um, and finding that metrics of making sure that, you know, are we looking hard and closely at programs? Are they working before we, we move on to other revenue sources? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be a lot of examination, a lot of just really chatting with the different departments in, in each of our committees and seeing how we can work to make what we have our investments, you know, really produce results. Got it. Uh, I wanted to talk about the committee you're in charge of on the council, and it's sustainability, city light, arts and culture. There's a lot under that umbrella. Uh, we got something, an email in actually regarding sustainability, came in for a viewer who wanted to ask you about this. Now that there's a climate element in the comprehensive plan, how will that get evaluated? What can we do to meet our climate goals for 2030, the year 2030? Robin, thank you very much for that email. Comp plans get an update this year, as you know. Yes. The city's climate action plan has this goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 58% below 2008 levels by the year 2030. Let's talk climate goals, please. Yes, we have some very ambitious goals. I think we hit them. And I, I'm not the expert in a lot of things, but I know that there are a lot of really passionate people who have been studying this for years, and I will really lean on them. Um, I think one of the... I'm, this is, you know, I'm only a few weeks in, yeah, right. but yeah, hoping to really, you know, talk to department heads and then talk to community members and talk to community mem members as well to try to see how we can work together to find these solutions and how we can reach these goals. Got it. And I know you're a new council member. There's a new leader at Seattle City Light, CEO Don Lindell, named for the job back in December here. Any ideas yet, and I know it's early, any ideas yet on what you might be working on with her when it comes to City Light? Yes, I know the big thing this year is the rate to pay, yeah. rate Increase, uh, yeah. increase. Mm -hmm. um, looking at that and then looking at the strategic plan for 2025. Mm -hmm. and so I look forward to working with the new director. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to cover there. Thank you. I, and I know we're just getting started on a lot of these. Can I talk about the arts with you? Because there's a lot of passionate people in this community, too. And you know this as well. The art scene in Seattle, as in a lot of cities, really was devastated during the pandemic. It is showing some signs of life coming back here. How do you see yourself helping in this situation, working with the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture? Yes, I am really excited because I've been involved with the arts my entire life. I'm a dancer. Mm -hmm. I also uh, paint as well. And so very excited going forward. Um, but yeah, working collaboratively with the 
Department of Arts and Culture because I feel like arts and culture has its hand in almost every single committee, mm -hmm. the 1% program. Right, for art, um, yeah. For arts. And, you know, it's arts is at the intersection of, you know, commerce and how do we revitalize our downtown area, bring people in? How do we become an arts and culture mecca, especially going forward with all these big events with FIFA soccer coming forward? Sure, right. So I think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities and in arts and culture, does amazing work. Um, and I'm excited going forward to be yeah. able to come up with, you know, some initiatives going forward. Yeah, and I, I think that culture part of it especially, I, I feel like you're going to be adding a lot there because this is an office that really deals with the diversity of different artists that are around, around Seattle and encouraging them to be a part of that. Can you talk about that piece too? Because I think that's a very important piece of this. We're talking about the culture of the city. It's bigger than the symphony or the ballet or anything like that. There's a lot going on here and introducing that piece of culture, I, I feel like it's a big part of your background and maybe something you're bringing to this job. Yeah, so I grew up uh, performing Chinese cultural dances. Very. Uh, uh, very specific and meeting a lot of other similar groups and friends who do something exactly like this in, in different cultures mm -hmm. and you know there are a lot of issues you know regarding you know finding jobs and uh, insurance health benefits as well as how do we find a place to practice performance space like all of these issues and how it promotes our cultures especially in schools and you know it's it's very exciting but at the same time how do we how we're able to promote that and their broader range, I think is gonna be very important. Yeah, very passionate community here once again. I, I need to wrap up and I've got about a minute uh, to spend here if we could. And I know you're very new to this job, but what's your favorite thing so far about becoming a council member? Can you expound on that, please? Oh, um, I think the sense of that, that excitement, that hope of better things to come, um, the sense of working together and getting to know fellow council members and, and hearing about their dreams and their plans. It's, it's so inspiring and so exciting, especially, you know, working with community members. Um, I'm getting a lot of emails, <laughs> basically. But it's, it's great to see because as a citywide uh, council member, people will always email their district and their, their city representatives. And, and seeing the interaction between the city, the district level representatives with their constituents um, is it makes me really excited going forward that, you know, I think we could, we're really planning to tackle a lot of these issues and place them as a priority, like with public safety, homelessness, and housing. And that sense of collaboration going forward is just amazing. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is Council Member Tanya Wu. Thank you very much from Citywide Position 8. I appreciate you being here. And we will see you next time on Council Edition.